Welcome everyone. My name is Divya Pawar and I am a training coordinator at the Temple Small Business Development Center. We help small businesses start and grow and we're doing this through consulting over the phone or through Zoom and with robust calendar of training events. You are here for the food business series, brand identity, packaging and advertising. This webinar is the sixth in the nine part series and it will create and will cover creating a brand identity, how to package your product and basics of advertising. We also have office hours tomorrow from 8.30 p.m. to from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. where you can ask specific questions. I will also post the link for it in the chat. For the webinar, we have all the attendees muted and we encourage you to put your questions in the chat or Q&A. All attendees will receive the presentation and recording after the webinar. Um, this webinar will be presented by Mark Plamondon from Tandem Associates. And with that, I will turn the floor to Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Nice to have you with us tonight. Uh, Jeff and I are looking forward to spending some time with you. Um, uh, before we get started, what we usually do is ask people to uh, on the chat, let us know uh, if this is your first um, webinar with us or if you've been in some previous ones. So just um, type a quick message there on the chat. Let us know um, where, where you stand and all that. Fifth, good for you, many. Hi, Kim. Nice to have you back. You've been to all of them. Okay, you've been to more than me then, Shannon, because I've only been to some of them. George, all of them, second. Excellent, excellent. Great. That's great. Well, uh, I hope you're finding them useful. Uh, I, I, I think, obviously, if you're going to a number of them, that, that's some indication that you're getting something out of them. And I think tonight you'll definitely get something out of this. Um, and it's, this is a fun one that, uh, you know, it's a, we're talking about brand identity and, and things like that. Some of you already may have um, your identities done and your packaging done and all. Some of you may be in the early stages of it or, or, or whatever, but um, we'll certainly uh, walk through it and, and see what we can do and spend some time together that way. We actually don't spend a lot of time on the advertising piece. We'll, we'll touch it uh, briefly, but we, in the next um, one where we talk about brand and uh, marketing communications and brand influencers, we get into it more deeply there. So um, with that, uh, we'll, we'll get started. I think, you know, obviously you guys have all been part of the number of these already. So, you know, about uh, the Small Business Development Center. It's a great, great program and a great resource for all of you to touch base. Um, for those of you who have not uh, been in one of mine yet, um, basically been running Tandem for about 26 years. We provide a full range of marketing services uh, to clients, most of them in the food business um, or many of them in the food business and most in the consumer products arena. Before that, I've worked in a number of advertising agencies in New York and Philadelphia. And um, I, I started teaching back at, in St. Joseph's in 2007, then uh, stopped for a little bit and I'm back teaching there again uh, this fall. So it's, I, I love that part of it. and looking forward to um, spending some more time this year doing that. You've all met George or most of you met George who won't be with us tonight, but uh, he'll be in future sessions. And then I'm going to let Jeffrey take you through his background real quick. I'm a, uh, hi everybody, how are you doing tonight? I'm a creative director, an art director, and designer. And I work for uh, myself currently. And uh, I work on consumer brands and packaging primarily, which uh, is, a, is a great field. And it constantly changes because uh, the branding and packaging, you know, have to be relevant to what's going on. They have to keep changing and their stories have to keep evolving. Um, I've worked for Campbell Soups, a lot of the same clients that Mark's worked for. And Mark and I have been working together now for about three years on one specific client, and we'll be able to share that with you uh, later on tonight. Yeah, just being modest, he's a he's a terrific designer and illustrator, he's, uh, and he's taught himself. He's an old school guy that did it by hand in the early stages of his career and now is you know very technologically advanced and doing it as well so he's being way too modest but um so we'll, we'll go through this uh you know in, in steps 
we're basically, um, when we're talking about learning, uh, I mean, the brand identity, it's really the critical elements of that look and feel as well as your key messaging for whatever you're doing. And that starts with very often your logo, your package, all of that, and then takes you through your social media presence and your website presence, and then uh, anything you do in terms of other marketing communications. So it's a, it's a very full um, boat, if you will. What's a brand? Um, and there's lots of different definitions, again, from a teaching perspective. Um, you know, you could start with the definition in the dictionary, and it's a type of product uh, manufactured by a particular company under a particular name. And we can all think of, you know, those in our own world and our own lives, how we think about it that way. Um, on a deeper level, uh, it's really about, um, you know, what differentiates your product from other products in the same category or same area that you're competing in. Um, and it's, it's what's going to make you successful, whether it's, you know, more volume, better in, in gross margins, and what, whatever that ends up being as a measuring stick. And it's basically, again, it could be a, a product or a service. It's, it's, the, it's the balance of your quality and the value that you deliver against that quality and the benefits that, that a consumer derives from experiencing you. Um, Another, this is from a, a Kotler is a well-known uh, textbook uh, kind of guy. Um, and this is something from one of his books. Um, you know, it's, it's not just about, um, you know, the performance of the brand. It's, it's, it's the performance. It's not the promotion. It's not advertising. It's really the, the gestalt of your brand that we're talking about. And so we want to make sure that we're all on the same page as we're getting started that way. Sometimes people think, they hear the word brand and they start thinking about, you know, oh, it's the advertising. It, it's not at all. And if, you know, if you think about, um, if any of you watched the Olympics uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, you, know, that I, you know, I watched pretty regularly, hundreds of times you saw the, the brand icon from the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, we're all familiar with the five rings that go, you know, generation to generation in terms of the Olympics, but the, the Tokyo font nomenclature and all that, that was the lockup for that. You saw it on everything they did. And um, so it, 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 it helped reinforce what they were trying to do, which was being the host country and having a positive experience. Unfortunately, COVID interrupted some of it, but um, that's the most recent example uh, of what really branding was about. So, um, in essence, it's a promise of value uh, on whatever dimension that is. Um, they, they're trying to get your attention in a, in a in very competitive marketplace for most of us. Uh, again, whether you're doing a product or a service, there's not many windows that haven't been you know, pursued by other people at this point. So you have to be very um, aware of that as you're trying to develop your brand. And um, it, it should have a sort of a higher level sort of strategy, if you will, behind it. So that that's what's driving you. If it's your company, it's, it's you as the, as the entrepreneur that's leading it. And so your brand, if you will, is part of it. And then anybody that works for you or on your behalf. Um, and, and so we, you know, we wanna make sure that that, that experience comes across no matter what you do. And one of the, one of the examples we always uh, or we refer to uh, in other classes is so if you've ever been to Chick Fil A, um, you know part of their thing is their it's a fast food place, but it's about superior service or your experience for the three minutes you're going to be there, and what they drive into every person who works there, um, whether you're you know 14 or 40 is, you know, my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's my, you'll hear it five times as you're going through the drive-through with Chick-fil-A or going up to the counter when COVID's not an issue. So that's part of their branding, if you will, is, is that they're there to make your experience special, even though it's a, basically it's a quick service restaurant. Okay, uh, different components. So your values uh, are, are most or, um, important, if you will, uh, up front. And so you have to define those and they drive the, everything that you do and they'll be the pillar or the foundation of everything you do. So you have to 
um, really think about that in the early going of your existence and make sure that um, you are really centered in on them and you, you know, you've identified them for yourself and then anybody that's going to work for you or the, what comes out in your product or your service delivers against those values. Uh, next would be the actual message. And um, so that's, it can be words and it can be pictures that deliver the message. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that as we go through this in terms of some specific examples, but um, it, it is, it's a, it's a combination of both of those uh, that really supports uh, what you do and add and, and everything that is underneath that has to support that message and, and, and credibility to that message. So if you're saying um, it's my pleasure to serve you and that's your part of your messaging, uh, you have to act that way. So you have to make sure that you really are delivering against that, that promise and, and that value and, and, and everything that you do. Uh, the personality, uh, you know, tone, attitude, it's, it's going to be, and I would guess, an extension of who you are, since most of you are entrepreneurs. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be an extension of your personality and the personality that you're trying to drive for your product or your service. And that's the emotional side of it, right? So there's, there's the rational side of what you offer, and that could be a performance space or some other value component of your, of your product or service. Um, you know, if it's better, it tastes better, it, it it's faster, it's more convenient, it's whatever. Um, but the emotional side of it is, is what's gonna deliver against as well. And many of us, that's the one that really triggers the ultimate sale, if you will, the ultimate uh, time for me to go ahead and, and decide I wanna buy your thing. It's that emotional connection. Um, and then brand icons are the tools that help us deliver that message and that personality. And that's all the elements that you know, Jeff will take you through for sure in some of the examples he shows, um, you know, what your, what your typeface looks like, whatever uh, messaging is, is there, uh, your logo, your layouts, your music, all of that, all of yeah, this. Is, this is a great page to always keep a, a, in your back pocket because some of the images and some of the uh, before and after images of the packaging, the actual packaging and the strategy, you'll see all these things come out into play, whether it's a person's face on the front of the package, uh, a cow's face or whatever it is. Frustration uh, um, of, of, of message. So th this is a great page to, to always keep in your back pocket. Yeah, thank I totally, I totally agree. You're right. Um, and it's the brand identity is different from the brand image, right? So we want to make sure again, we're, we're talking about the same element or same thing. So that's the visual elements that, that Jeff was just referring to that, that distinguish people in, in their consumer's mind. So it's, um, it's, it, it's the, the name, the logo, the colors, all that um, drives it. So the, the, the image is the result of all of those efforts, whether it works or doesn't work. Um, sometimes it works really well and, it, and it, it portrays a positive image. Other times, the it may not be a positive that, that comes out of whatever you're you're experiencing from all that look and the messaging and all that so um that's the identity is a is a much broader concept than just um you know what thinking about a logo or whatever it would be uh the image refers to right perceptions it's got the beliefs and the consumer's uh, understanding of that um and it's, they're both important to your brand um, and a firm can enhance that brand loyalty by, by, brand loyalty by making sure that there's a, a, a combination of things that are working between the identity and the image. You don't want things to be disparate at that point. Like your, your identity has to deliver against your image and the image has to be reflective of what identity that you're trying to um, establish. Um, and, you know, we'd all be surprised how important this all is. I, I remember reading, um, I can't remember the guy's name at the moment, um, famous business writer that, you know, it's all about establishing yourself as a brand. I mean, you are a brand within your, your world, of forgetting your entrepreneurial business, but each of us is a, is a brand as our person, right? So within our family structure, our friends, the people we work with, 
there's an, an element of brand in all of us, whether you're a, you know, really super nice person that's really supportive or you're not a nice person, um, you know, you're really tough on people or whatever, or you're very quiet. All of those are elements of, of your brand and, and how you portray yourself. And if you think through everything that's brought you to this in your life, what's established you as a person, that's your brand. And, and um, you know, that's a, a way to then think about how we're gonna create that for our products or services. So Apple's one of the more obvious examples that we can point to in, in terms of an example. Um, so it, it's really that what makes Apple special isn't necessarily uh, just about the performance of the product, it's about the whole element of it, everything that's there, the product, the packaging, the technologies, the, the, the way if you've ever been in an Apple store, it doesn't look like any other store really. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's that simplicity, that sort of stark beauty of what Apple delivers against, and it's it's reinforcing on every dimension, from you know once you walk in the store or once that box shows up in your house if you're having it shipped to you, whether it's a phone or it's a computer or it's iP uh, whatever it, the, the the earbuds, it's whatever it is. They're all very much delivering in a very similar vein against that brand, uh, that brand image and brand identity. Jeff, why don't you talk a little bit about that from your perspective? It's so funny as an artist, you know, we have been around this darn computer since its inception, but the finesse that they have and what they do to make people, um, I'm gonna use it as the best possible term since I am one to make them an Apple geek is just getting a sticker, a decal, along with all this technology you buy. You get a simple sticker and you look around at different cars and on people's windows or their office or wherever they are, this little dopey Apple white Apple logo is there. Um, it's almost like having a tattoo, you know, a Harley Davidson tattoo in your arm, but when you're a geek, you're not gonna get that or you might, but the Apple just, they take such care and they have such finesse. It's just a great way of, of uh, dealing with people. And uh, I think the end result is just that loyalty. They put out an amazing product, but everybody puts out a pretty good product, but how many people line up for two or three days beforehand to get a new product or go get the new phone? And it's not like they're real, real cheap either, guys. So, I mean, they really got a, a, a good cult going, a good cult of Apple, but it is a great product. Yeah, and they, they're happy, you know, on the value portion, they're happy not being the cheapest, right? There, there's a lot of cheaper laptops out there that we can all get uh, and that will do most of the job. I mean, obviously if you're an artist, you need some of the elements that, you know, Jeff needs versus, I mean, but I don't, I don't necessarily need uh, an Apple laptop. I can get by with any PC for what I'm mostly doing, but um, I'm convinced that I want one of these. I, I want an Apple in a Mac and it's, uh, I pay more for it, which, you know, at times I question my own sanity that way. Um, but it, it really is like, I don't know if you've ever gotten that product, but when it comes in that white, just the difference to me as an idiot consumer, that white box, if I buy, I've bought laptops from my office that are regular PC laptops that comes in regular corrugated, you know, it's, it's crappy foam. Even the way it shows up is not as interesting. Whereas the, the way it's packaged in that white box and everything's got its own little cubby and it's meticulously put together, um, it all it all supports that brand image. And, and that's or it, the reason I'm showing that example is just think about all the dimensions that that is delivering for that brand in terms of supporting its imagery and identity. You have to think about that for your brand, your, your product, the same way. Everything you do, everything, the naming, the colors, the the way it's delivered, whatever, it all delivers against that brand. So um, obviously there's there's five different senses that all can uh, uh, support this branding component. This is the Moser's piece that he wrote a while ago in the Harvard Press. And I, I think it's a really good example of, so, you know, we have hearing, seeing, touch, nose and, and taste. And if you just think about it in your own lives, uh, may, maybe some of you are, you know, that are younger aren't familiar with Snap, Crackle, and Pop that are, you know, down on the bottom left there. But they took a rice cereal, which is just a puffed rice cereal, nothing special about it. But by 
creating this brand around the way it sounds when you pour the milk on it, 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 it built that brand. And, and, and they use these characters as part of that support for it, but they, they leveraged the sound of their product as a point of differentiation, which is you know, really smart. <laughs> um, obviously all of us have experienced the cheese pull of a pizza and how appetizing that is. So that's all I appeal. Uh, touch and how, uh, you know, um, the Pillsbury Doughboy, that when it gets poked in the stomach is a, is a wonderful uh, way to carry that over. Starbucks, this, when you walk into Starbucks, it's got a very distinct smell, right? It smells different than any other coffee place out there, it seems. And, and they leveraged their brand in the early going based on that smell. Um, and then uh, obviously taste and, you know, whatever that taste would be. So you're playing to all of them. Sometimes you want to focus in on just one of those senses in, in terms of, you know, making a point of difference with your product. Everybody wants to taste good. If you're in the food, we're talking about food business, right? So everybody wants to taste good. So that by itself may not be the, the, the point of difference that's going to set you apart. There may be some element otherwise that you want to leverage as you do it. Um, And so, yeah, these are pretty much the same kind of points. We've talked about Apple here and how uh, different, you know, CEOs or characters can be spokespeople as part of your iconography. Um, obviously, Steve Jobs was, was Apple and, and became synonymous with it. We all know other spokespeople that are similar, uh, whether they're the com company's president or whether they're just representing that company that, you know, the, the insurance business has, has made a, a lot of this. The State Farm guy, you know, that's delivering stuff, uh, you know, whatever, the Geico, um, um, uh, what's his name, the little green guy, um, you know, all of those are, are, are versions of ways of reinforcing your brand with different methods. Um, you know, back in the day, when Jeff and I were starting the business, you didn't mess with a logo, you left it alone. So if it was a, you know, the, the Yankees cap was always that deep, deep blue with a white insignia on it. Well, that, you know, today that doesn't fly anymore. Everybody wants to have some customization. They want to wear a hat that's working for them. So you have to stretch it a bit. And now, but whether you're wearing any one of these three hats, you know, it's a Yankee hat. It doesn't have to be that, that iconic blue anymore. And, and, and the logo was a lar large part of that. Uh, it's Jeff, you, everything became fashion. Everything became fashionable. I noticed in the chat section, Stacy had said to the panelists, can you give an example uh, in the food business of superior brand imaging? And I think Mark already just kind of hit it um, with Starbucks. There's nothing quite like that uh, where they reinvent the, the size of your coffee you're getting, uh, obviously how much you're purchasing for the coffee uh, and all the little delicacies you can get within that store. Starbucks just, uh, I mean, they nailed it. They hit a, a, a grand slam when they started. And, uh, and they're continuing to, to do great. Their packaging is fantastic. Stores are gorgeous, uh, no matter where you are. So that's a great example. Uh, you know, Starbucks and Yankees and Apple. Um, that Starbucks is a hero, a great hero brand. Yeah, and I think, Stacy, another one would be in the food service world like, of Q QSRs, Panera sort of invented that, uh, that next phase. It's better than a fast food, traditional fast food, but it's not as good as like a necessarily a sit down restaurant. So they, they wedge themselves in there. So they're between, let's say an olive garden where you have to sit down and, you know, give a tip and have me waited on, but the food quality in a Panera is, is way better than let's say what's in a, in a McDonald's or a Chipotle or whatever. So I think they've done a really nice job of, of building their imagery. Um, it's got a nice look, their, their stores are really pretty looks very healthy and fresh you know they got the baked goods up front so it's a the, all of the elements of their components they've tried to fight on that same coffee level um you know with duncan and 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 starbucks trying to lure you in with some of their coffees or drinks so um, that's another example of uh one that i would uh, point to there's a lot um, um and I'm sorry, so Laura, you started working at a type house back in the day. Wow, and there's not many people that know what a type house was any <laughs> left anymore. That's great. Given your age, Laura. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're showing your age. All right, um, so let's keep moving here. 
Um, so just make sure, you know, an icon is a person or thing regarded as that symbol, which, you know, we, we have them all day long on our phones, right, that we're all dealing with now. Now we don't actually, we don't even use our phone much anymore to talk to people. We use our phone to write stuff or text back and forth or take pictures or whatever. And we can't even say, you know, yes, or I like it. Now we just do thumbs up, thumbs down, an exclamation point or whatever on top of the text. I mean, we become very, very visually oriented that way. Um, so let's, let's do this logo quiz, if we can. We'll go into the chat. So these are uh, whatever, four times five. There's 20 different symbols up here. I'm going to cherry pick a couple and see if you can uh, identify who they are. So we're going to start. The easy one is top left, which go ahead and um, tell us what you think that top left one is. What company is that? Correct. That's the easy one. Pepsi it is. All right. So let's go down to the second row and let's go uh, right below it. What's that? What's that star there? Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's Carl's. Very good. Um, uh, let's. We obviously the no Starbucks as we've talked about. What's the? Uh, so right below the star is Wendy's. Let's go to the right of Wendy's. What's that? Yep. Yeah. So how crazy is that, folks? Just think about that. You're looking at two squiggly lines on a piece of paper, and you know what the hell, what company that is. That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of stuff that branding and iconic icons can do for you. Um, and, and, and they're not a huge advertiser. They're a big advertiser, but not a huge advertiser. That's just exposure over time in a, in a familiar fashion that you're, you, you can identify that way. All right, let's go down another row and go to this black shape here. What's that? Bingo. Yep, it's quick. Exactly. And then uh, we'll go one more row down and um, let's do, I'm getting too easy. Let, let's do this one, I guess, the, the last one. Yeah. Adam, you're good at this. You're all yeah. <laughs> some kind of ham. Very good, Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yes, that's Oscar Meyer. So um, again, very representative of we, we all as individuals. Some of these are easy to recognize. Some of them may be a little harder and some of them have a little bit of a regional skew to it. But um, clearly, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's something that reinforces the whole point about branding. And, and this, this bottom left one, uh, the bottom, this one is Panera that I was talking about earlier. Like that's got a, to me, and Jeff, you should weigh in as well. That's got a higher, sort of feel to it, whatever, then let's say, where's the McDonald's, you know, or, or this is in and out Burger here, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, Panera is certainly soothing. But what I love so much about this board, and it's my favorite board that we show, is that um, if you're starting to look at your brand, or if you're going to create a brand, look at all the options that you have just in using the human form. Mark pointed out the Panera. And some of these brands are very, very old. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC or Colonel Sanders is this really cool graphic guy. Now, Wendy's, she used to be much, much more graphic, but now she's kind of got to be almost like a cartoon character or something. She's, she's different. Starbucks has an awesome revolution. Mr. Pringle, he's crazy. But go over to the Quaker Oats guy in the, in the top. Um, he's so old fashioned. He's this gorgeous painting from, you know, 50 years ago or something. There, as you create your brand, as you look to move forward, in the voice and in your voice and in your storytelling, that's what's so much fun because it, 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 everything's wide open to you. Everything is wide open to you. It's really, really exciting. Yep. So uh, Adam's wondering what the bottom green one is. Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> yep. Very good, Laura. Yep. Laura. Way to hit it. That's exactly right. It's Sprite. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can share the answer key with you, uh, later. I, 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 it's, I'm trying to think if there's any that are, this is, uh, Papa uh John. right. Papa John. Papa John. Yeah. This is Krispy Kreme down here. Betty Crocker. This is D DQ, right? Yeah. You got um, 
in and out Burger, uh, Del Monte, uh, BK, Burger King. So a lot of fast food ones, obviously. But um, so yes, we can share the answers with you as well. Um, wow. The other thing, and, and again, Jeff can talk more to this than I can, but in, we're all familiar with Nike. I'm, I'm sure most of us have Nike products in our closet, right? Multiple, whether it's shirts or shoes or hats or whatever, shorts, uh, you know, all of us have it. But, um, you know, think about it started in 90 and 71 and where we are today. And, and again, if you saw any of the Olympics, that crazy swoosh was on every, every uniform in the U.S. hat. Whether you were a runner, a swimmer, the medal ceremony outfit that you wore, the jacket you wore into the pool, the jacket, the, you know, whatever. They, that swoosh was on everything that they wore. So not, and it started as a shoe thing, right? Well, it's no longer about the shoes. It's about everything else. Jeff, go ahead if you have some questions. I mean, absolutely. Mark, there's nothing quite like the Nike swoosh. It's, I'll never forget the first time I saw it on the PGA Tour. And I'm like a pretty old guy and I'm pretty loyal to the Titleist and uh, Wilson and all the old stuff that used to be on PGA. But I'm thinking, what the hell the heck is Nike doing on the PGA Tour? What's this all about? But uh, they're everywhere and they deserve to be because they actually stand for, um, for the, the person, the athlete, the person, the person wants to be the athlete. Um, I don't think their clothes are any better than anybody else's, but boy, it looks, if you, you feel much better when you have that, that symbol on you, it feels good. And that's a pretty good thing. They deliver I'm feeling good. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and can, the, the other point about this one is, is the consistency of it. They've just never wavered from, I mean, it's, it's a little different, you know, obviously they had Nike, the, the four letters in there in the early years. And now a lot of the time they don't need it because they're so globally recognizable, but they, that, that swoosh has never really swayed much. And that, that's the other lesson is don't, whenever you establish your brand, don't keep playing with it every year, you know, the, the consistency of it. And that's why the chart up front, this one that we did, the reason we're all familiar with all these is because they've all been around a long time in this basic arena. They've definitely been refreshed. Some of them, the Frito-Lay, definitely been refreshed the eq has been refreshed so on but um it, it that consistency is the other element that uh you know about your brand and and consistency of message consistency of look uh it's not something to change annually um okay so there's a, a study uh from interbrand a big research company these are the best global brands of 2020 um and they they look at it on a number of dimensions basically financially the role that the brand plays in purchase decisions by cons by consumers, and then the actual competitive strength that it has within the category um, that they that they are competing in. Um, so um, here's the brands one through twenty five, and if you just go across, there's not a lot of surprises here. They're all big, big global brands that we're all familiar with, um, and most of us probably either currently own or have owned or aspire to own you know, almost everything in this, in this first list, right? So um, th they're, they're all uh, terrific companies in their own right. They've all differentiated themselves in different ways. Um, and, and most of them have been around for a while. The big ones are, you know, technology companies or auto companies. Uh, you've got number 17, Louis Vuitton is, you know, one of the, uh, I guess the first fashion brand that's listed in, in the value there. Um, Chanel is later, but if you, if you look through them, like some of them, their, their positioning is on the value end of the chain, like the, 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 their value brands, McDonald's is a good example. It's cheap, fast food, right? But, um, but they're there and Ikea is cheap, uh, assemble your own uh, product. And then you've got, um, Honda as a, you know, moderately priced, um, you know, car or whatever. And then Mercedes is a very expensive price. So you're, you're covering all ends of it um, in terms of, so it's not just how you appeal on the low end of value or on the higher end of value. Um, it, it, it covers the gamut that way. Um, so that's the first 25. The next 25, you get into a little bit more of some of the, the fashion brands that are in there. 
our first real food. I mean, Budweiser, you know, Pepsi's been there, Coke's been there. Budweiser sneaks in as I think the first alcohol or, or uh, beverage that way. Um, Netflix was, wasn't around 10 years ago, um, is, is obviously new to the mix. Uh, Tesla is a, a growing brand, obviously huge um, and, and moving in the positive up direction. And then there's a couple of financial services companies that are there, uh, AXA, Goldman Sachs, and so on. And then the list just keeps going through that 75 as you go through. So there's in you know, a Starbucks, MasterCard, uh, PayPal, which we're all getting to, uh, you know, more and more, we see that as part of our lives. Uh, Kellogg's, uh, you know, first real food brand that way, not a beverage. Uh, Nestle, Danone, Danone, um, and so on. There's our first toy brand, I think, Legos. And then the final 25. Uh, now you're getting into, you know, some that are a little smaller or more globally oriented, um, you know, that way. Huawei, um, Cat, you know, that's a B2B, um, you know, uh, tractor company, um, John Deere, and so on. Hennessy, Burberry, Johnny Walker, which I hope to have some after we finish our webinar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's, that's, that's the list of just to give you a sense of globally, um, you know, what kind of brands are, are out there and how, how they've done. And I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that most of us know the large majority of those brands um, in, in our world, in our experience. So some of the things that in, in inner brands experience, what, what drives some of the strength. So one is leadership. That's one of the factors or components of what they say drives brand strength over time. Um, and, and then it puts into the description of each of those in terms of what they mean by leadership. So obviously, and, and these are things for you to think about as you're establishing your brand, the, the direction of, of what, what you want people to do, the alignment within the organization, the empathy that you're trying to uh, achieve with the, the, your ultimate consumer, and then how agile you are, you know, how quickly you can move um, and, and, and change. So those are important uh, elements on the leadership side. On the engagement side, which is more of an external factor, as opposed to those, the first set were an internal uh, components. These are external components. Uh, the distinctiveness, we've talked about that before, of what you're about. Uh, your coherence, and that's like, you know, what, where does it really fit? Are you, are you jiving with what consumers want? Is it a good fit that where? And then your participation, um, you know, are, are you, and this is more important today than ever in terms of really getting into a dialogue or having a conversation with the ultimate consumer. The way social works today, you know, where you have to be very responsive in terms of, you know, what you're saying, if somebody has something to say back to you, how, how do you respond back to that if they have an unpleasant experience? How you handle that is huge. Um, and we talk more about that in our influencer seminar that we do uh, in the next, I guess, the next week. Um, so those are the external components that drive it. And then obviously your relevance, um, you know, how that really plays into your brand um, across those dimensions. Trust is a huge, huge uh, issue that you can leverage um, and you want to protect that uh, at all costs, like the way that you, you establish trust with people and, and what they, um, they think of your brand and how that goes on. If you think about it in your own experience, you know, if you've gone somewhere and it, and it worked, like you have a really good product experience, even if it was a negative thing that happened and you reached out and it worked out well, that's a, that's a really important part of establishing trust. And, and, and that does more for your brand, quite honestly, than just delivering on the positive side. If you have, uh, and we've all had those experiences, right? If you have a bad experience with the brand, if they handle it well, you, you can lock that person in as a you know, lifelong customer. And not only that, they're gonna go tell five of their friends that story, right? If you have a bad experience at a restaurant and uh, you know, they make good on it, you're going to tell everybody you had a good experience of that. If they don't make good on it, if they don't make you feel better, you know, if your food came out cold or whatever, um, you're going to go tell everybody that it was a bad deal. And that, so it's a very important element. 
Jeff, you got anything? No, it's the, it's the biggest element there is, and, and, and Mark nailed it. Because at the end of the day, you'll end up saying, oh, guess what, man? That was awesome. And then it's a great story to share with your buddies or your friends or, or anybody. Uh, it's huge. It's the, it's the biggest it's the biggest one up there. Yeah. I mean, you know, in business cases, they, they talk about Nordstrom, you know, sort of that was their thing, right? You could return anything to Nordstrom ever, you know, like if it, you've had it, you've used it, you can bring it back. And the old story of, you know, somebody... Uh, they brought tires back into uh, into a Nordstrom, and Nordstrom said, "Yeah, we'll take them." And they don't even sell tires, but they they basically wanted their customers to be satisfied. So they it, it was you know whether that's folk story or not, it's indicative of what they really believed in, and that's why that story has been in in business cases. It's been told a lot of times about how, but they were they were somebody that if you bought something there. Um, you could absolutely return it with no questions asked as, as we've, as you marched on. Um, and, and again, we've all had that experience as, as a consumer, how valuable that is to us. Um, and then, um, you know, you got to change, you got to be able to adapt. Um, and you know, what, what's going on. We talked a little bit about this in some of the examples, but the brands, while your iconic view might not change all that often, you have to change and, and be sort of adaptive within what's going on um, in the world out there. So, you know, the, the, everybody talks about millennials now and how different they are is from a shopping experience and what they believe. You, you bet that some of these larger companies that have been around 75, 80 years selling their products are, are looking at millennials and trying to figure out how to treat it differently for them and not just stay the course of what they've been doing. The cereal, cereal guys are a perfect example. Um, you know, regular cereals that somebody like my age might have grown up on. It's not a breakfast that that many millennials will will tap into these days. So you have to figure out a way to sell whether you're Kellogg's or whoever uh, different ways of doing it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, in today's world, it's multi-channel, right? From moving on, it's not just I. I we used to in in packaged goods, you controlled the experience years ago by, by what was happening on the shelf in that store, wherever you were sold, not anymore. Now that brand is, you know, it's all over the internet, it's all over, it's whether it's on social, it's e-commerce, how that's all playing out. And it, it really it is driving a lot of the difference in, in today's world and you have to be focused on that and be able to adapt to that. Um, so yeah, so now you can start brands that are unconstrained by retail environment. That's what I was just talking about. So back then you, you relied on, you know, whether it was a grocery store or, or whatever to, um, you know, live and die by whatever they decided your brand and where it got and all that. Now you drive some of that yourself. If you can figure out e-commerce on your own, you know, you can do what you want to do and sell a lot of your product and you don't need a retailer and you'll see. If you, when you do our, our boot camp at the end of the nine sessions, if you participate in that, um, you'll hear from one of the, the subject matter experts that we have is a guy who works for uh, ShopRite food stores and, and, and you know, um, he's the general manager of, of, the, of the 12 of them that the Brown company owns. And he'll tell you that, you know, what they experienced that if you're going in to try and pitch them to get on your shelves is one thing. But now, which is a, a challenge to get on the shelf, now you have that opportunity to go do it directly yourself. Uh, and this just got published, so that's why I wanted to um, I wanted to include it. It's a it's a little bit on the fringe of what we're talking about, but it's it's indicative of some of the things that are going on in our world. So, um, the, this is uh, the research question was: What have you done for the first time since the, the uh, COVID started? And 24% said they've participated in online video with family or friends, which is probably true, right? Zoom didn't, nobody knew what Zoom was. Uh, that's not true. Very few people knew Very what Zoom few. was prior to March uh, of 2020. And now we're all, it's become a, a verb, right? We all Zoom. He wanted to Zoom. Um, uh, order groceries online is up 21%. The, you know, the, the estimates I've seen, it's, it, it accelerated online grocery shopping by five to seven years. They didn't expect us to be at this level until five or six years from now. And we're already there just because of what happened. Uh, 
Same thing with purchase product online, order a meal from restaurants, taking a class online, watching a movie online, and so on. So our online world has exploded in the last you know, 12 to 18 months. And um, that's going to change the way we are. Some of it will go back you know, to a little bit of what we were. But um, a lot of this will change forever how it's done. And your branding needs to be part of that. And your experience with branding and your approach to branding needs to, online is really important. Whereas again, 18 months ago, these numbers, many of these would have been in single digits. Um, right, so don't, and this is the plus side of that. Don't, you don't have to be constrained by the current business model. You don't have to be constrained by distribution op options. Just think about what consumers want and need and then deliver against that and, and deliver it in excellence or with excellence. And um, that's sort of the approach that uh, you need to keep focusing on as you go through. Uh, back to the inner brand report just for a second. In Microsoft top three brand. Uh, you don't have to profit that as a business. You have to have the consent of customers. This is more like we were talking about before um, that people are holding companies accountable for what they, they are doing. And so you have to hold, st hold strong with that. Um, that you know the brand is a promise, but it's a promise of something deeper. It's this relationship that you're building. It's that trust factor. It's that uh, that whole conversation piece that we've been talking about, and that's important to keep in mind as you're establishing your brand. Um, that it's it's become even more important this way. Back ten years ago, you know the three seconds that people spend uh, thinking about brand selection at the shelf of a grocery store. It used to be three seconds out and done. Now people are turning the label over. They're looking at it. They're thinking about it, or they're reading about it in advance. What kind of company that is? Are you a you know a fair certified for coffee growers, or are you just you know raping and pillaging the land? And all of that is now part and, and in play. It's not just I'm going to go get some you know cereal off the shelf. Sustainability. Uh, you could it's in today's news actually with the whole you know, UN findings and all that. Uh, the climate is changing. It's, it's become a, you're going to hear more and more about that, obviously, in the year ahead. Um, companies are trying to figure out how to adapt to that because consumers are going to care more about that. Five years ago, three years ago, maybe even six months ago, consumers might not have cared much about it, but they're definitely, they're focused on it now. And the, the companies that are getting ahead of it and thinking about it and being carbon neutral or whatever, um, that's, that's going to be a big component and way to differentiate. So in your case, I mean, you're all going to be small brands, it, you know, it, you just have to make sure you're paying attention to sustainability and what you're doing. So when you're thinking about packaging or the way you source products or whatever, all of that is something you want to think about because down the road, more and more consumers are going to pay attention to those kind of elements of it. Um, right, so this is, let's see if this actually works. I forgot to click on this last time. It's a video, yeah, here we go. Let's see if, is, uh, do you see it loading? I don't see anything come up yet. You don't see anything come up? It's just the bottle still? Yeah. All right, well, uh, let me see if this plays. Hold on, I'm gonna come back. All right, so do you see this now? Let me know if you see this video. You see the video? Yes. You want me to draw ketchup? Okay. Ketchup. Draw ketchup. Sorry, I should draw anything, food, ketchup, bottle, or something. I don't think I'm doing this right. <laughs> that's not a ketchup bottle. That's a shampoo. And I guess a tomato here. Ready to see the masterpiece? <clears throat> Bottle. I don't even know if I spelled the name right. 
Get some buckle. Got a little bit old school. I don't know. It's like the only ketchup that I know. Mustard. That's mustard. Yeah. I love that guy. <laughs> How about it? That's fantastic. So, uh, if you if you were the brand person for Heinz, how proud of would you be of that, or the president of that company, or whatever, that all across the globe? That's the response you got. Now, you know, it's a, it's a well-crafted video as well, but uh, the point is well, well taken. It's a uh, universal and everybody's familiar with the shape of it and the whole nine yards, just amazing. Okay, that's the end of my piece. Now we'll get to the real star of the show. Jeffrey, you're on. Hi everybody. And uh, it's great to be here with everyone. And then thanks Mark, I appreciate your kind words. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Marshall and that screen you see right there, Mark's going to click for me as we go through each one, but that's right there that I've done over the years. Uh, and it's a lot of it's about branding and packaging and, and uh, now it's uh, about sales and social media and it constantly keeps changing. But at the end of the day, it's about storytelling and it's about uh, relating to people and telling uh, great consumer stories and, and stories that, that make a product relevant to uh, us, uh, for us. Mark, if you want to go ahead. I will. Uh, you broke the, up a little um, bit there, Jeff, so I just want to reiterate. Oh, Jeff, did all, Jeff did all this packaging. That's all, all my mess. I was the guy with the uh, two pencils, the guy with the red hair and the, and the <laughs> yeah, other right, show. Right. Um, brands are, you know, they're always telling stories, like Mark said in, in the beginning of this whether it's innovation or trust, leadership, or, or just great taste uh, when it comes to food. Um, some brands, you know, at the end of the day, they're just trying to connect to consumers. And often the only thing they have to connect with consumers initially is that package, is that first instant time when you're walking up, that, that moment when you see them for the first time, what is this going to be all about? What is the story? Um, I have... Uh, some before and after designs that uh, I'm going to share with you right now that show older brands uh, and, and refreshes, um, uh, newer brands or, or startup brands. So there's a little bit of everything I'm going to share with you. Some of the things you'll recognize, some of the things you may not, but they all have kind of interesting stories. And uh, I guess we can push on with that. Uh, this was a refresh of a package. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the sweet and low package. It used to be a really big thing in the early 60s. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until around the 70s that, it, you know, it's a sweetener, an artificial sweetener. And it took a lot of hits uh, because it's made of saccharin. And then a lot of other artificial sweeteners, and, it, and they're still coming out. They continue to come out. But sweet and low was the, was the big mama for a real long time, and they were number one. Um, and the package on the left, believe it or not, was still around. I mean, it looks like it's from something from 1962 you know, or three, but it it's, um, was around in the, in the late 90s. Even the good housekeeping seal on it. Uh, just how stark and, and um, you know, there's no real, again, there's no real finesse there. There's not a lot of massaging going on with those elements. My strawberries, my cup, my food. So when I started doing initial layouts for this project, uh, we wanted to take the pink packet, which they're all known for. If you were going into a restaurant, you'd get the pink packet with the sweet and low. So we got away from the red, started making it pink, and just finessed all the elements so that they had a better eye flow, so that when you saw it on shelf, it popped off against the NutraSweet and against all the other items that, that they have to fight against all now. Um, and this is actually still the current package. It's about eight years old now. Uh, and I still go into market and I'm still real happy with it. It's, it's a nice, clean, simple story. And sometimes that's all you want to tell. That's all you want to tell. Um, but that's about it with that one. That was a real fun project. This is another refresh. Basically the exact same thing as what I just described with Sweet and Low. Um, Asher Chocolate. 
Chocolates is a company out of uh, P Pennsylvania. It's a very local company. And they've had them chocolates and all kinds of stuff for, for decades and decades. And they've had their Easter products, which is a great season for them. Uh, and they've had them in that same package that you see on the left, a hand-painted, hand-watercolored uh, botanical with that window box. So they didn't change the box at all, but what we did was just uh, refresh the logo and refresh the illustration to make it a little more Easter looking, a little more graphic, a little more fun, a little more bright. The typography is a little more aggressive, but um, when it's on shelf with like five or six other pieces that they also sell, they're all color coded properly. They all have a certain um, shelf uh, stamina. They really are strong on shelf compared to, uh, and again, there was nothing wrong with that other package 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, but I think a lot of times people forget that they really have to fight it's a big fight out there uh, when you're on shelf. You really have to be aggressive. And uh, I, Mark said in the beginning, it's um, your components of a brand have to be there. Well, the components of this brand, you know, aside from the window and you see the gorgeous food, is the illustration and the colors. Um, they were a little soft before and we were just trying to make them a little more aggressive. So that's kind of what happened with Asher. It was a fun project too. I like that one. Yeah. And, and I. Plus the food tastes good. I'm sorry. Plus the, the eggs are awesome. Yeah. And I think I, I, all, all of us would agree that the, there's so much more of a sense of a brand, the one on the right than on the left. The left just looks like a, a box that more of a generic, you know, it's the product that you're, you're focused on there a little bit more than anything else. And, and nobody's going to necessarily see that it was Asher's or it's right. hard to read the milk chocolate and variety and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I, you, you've established a brand on the right side. And, and I think that's, huge upgrade uh henry's is a company a very uh, medium-sized company out of the midwest and they had that pop bottle on the left for years and it's one of those cases again where all the elements don't exactly kind of fit it's not always about elements um but most of the time it's color elements typography uh pho photography uh, we spend a lot of time mark and i currently right now uh, working with photography uh, to help sell the projects we work on. And when you sell food, you have to, um, you really have to take into account that that appetite appeal and what's going to grab someone and what's going to work well on shelf. Again, if, I'm sure everybody right now, as I'm sitting here speaking to you, you go to that aisle and there's a lot of choices for uh, salad dressings. It's, it's, it's really intense. So Henry's previously only had one little salad in the upper right-hand corner, their logo, and then whatever typography. So we tried to just consolidate some of the elements, create a better timing with some of the elements, put the logo name, and leave the, um, I don't call it botanical, but it's not. It's a still life of vegetables at the bottom. But I like to think of it as a botanical because I wanted to have a certain rhythm. I wanted to look like a bouquet. I wanted to look like something that is promises or maybe over promises. I know it's just a salad at the end of the day, but that dressing, when it's on that salad, it's going to deliver something really, really, really special. So that's kind of how we, we helped out Henry's that way. The Taste of Thai is a, is, a, is a great example of a company that um, had a, a product line of stuff that really needed to have a little bit of finesse. Um, it was actually one of the first companies, the, aside from like Chung King from the 60s, that started looking at Thai food and making Thai food that you could purchase at home or purchase at the store and make at home. Um, they also did a taste of China and a taste of India after we got done this packaging. And then the package you see on the right is the proposed packaging that we're working on now. Uh, and that's going to be the upgrade. So the one previously uh, was the older one. And now this is a, a new, more energetic packaging that we think would have a, 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 a more premium voice on shelf. Uh, a lot of the elements are still the same. There's still that beautiful typography. But I think you can see the food much better. Um, I can read, uh, rather than all that handwritten type on peanut noodles, our typography is simplified. Uh, and there's still a lot of messaging on these packages to assure you that it's, uh, you know, quality and authentic. It really was the first authentic Thai food that you could purchase and make at home. So this is an upgrade that we're working on currently.
Uh, Jeff, uh, Stacy asked a little a minute or two ago about the sales increase after the box design change. Absolutely, and they all and for the most part, well, you know, you'll know if you go to another seminar. Nobody has ever show all the, their mistakes, so a lot <laughs> of times they uh, they do dramatically, and it's not only that. It's it's pretty fun or fun, and, and I'm sure Mark will uh, expound on this. A lot of times, say that taste the tie package costs two twenty dollars in the store. Something exact same product, it's exact same package. They could sit there and tell you why we could probably get like two sixty nine for that. They'll say that the impression that it's making is greater um, than what you have previously. So they'll say you might be able to jack your price up or get more for it. Again, it goes back to that perception that Mark is saying uh, was talking about. So we can we can create something. Well, you'll, you'll see it in a very short amount of time when we show you what we're, we're currently working on. So. Oh, this is a very short amount of time. Uh, about three years ago, uh, Mark and I were talking and he, he got in touch with me and it was, it was perfect timing for both of us, but he had the opportunity to approach this uh, Grassland Butter, which was a 100 year old company that wanted to rebrand themselves. That package on the left was their previous package or its current package, but it, you know it's getting shifted out as we speak. Um, but they wanted to, rebrand themselves and transform their story into a leadership story and also a story about non-GMO. And, you know, when, when I first was like, oh, God, you know, when I first saw this, I mean, I, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you guys that, you know, I thought it, uh, it was pretty steady. And Mark being very cautious, and he's a, uh, and I'm cautious too, I really am, but when I see something like that, I get really excited, like, wow, what can we change? What can we change? And he's like, no, 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 Jeff, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Well, he, he stuck with me and he listened. And when we went back to the client, we went, we gave the client a range of options. Um, ones that were, one that was somewhere that were close into what you see on the left. And this particular one that you see on the right, um, which is basically that package to the left, but with just different elements. Things massaged a lot differently. Uh, timing and staging and all those great things. Uh, and, and believe it or not, this is a country, a, a, com a country, this is a company out of the Midwest, uh, you know, an old, old company, a great butter company, a great dairy company, and they went for it. Now, this is pretty radical. Uh, and it's one of the things Mark said, you don't do in the beginning of our seminar. But there, I don't think you could go to market with that package on the left and put a non-GMO logo on it. Uh, and it, and it would sell. And, and what Mark just said a minute ago, too, you know, when you turn the package over and you start talking about our commitment to non-GMO dairy, what we feed our cows, how we treat our cows, how we treat uh, the farmers who are behind us, that is the brand. Yeah, um, that's really what it's all about. Uh, so, and again, we were really lucky that we were able to uh, make this happen. Uh, real proud of this guy. And, and uh, uh it's, it's, it was a, it was a highlight in my in my career. I really love it. And, and sometimes you get very very lucky too. The next slide is a piece of artwork that was done. Hang, yeah, hang on. I'm, okay. I, I want one story I want to tell about. And Jeff's absolutely right in the way he described it all. And it, it is a perfect example of you know taking some risk, but but being um, you know being true to what you were trying to establish as that brand. So the the one on the left was something that the company just sold, but it didn't really have a brand. Jeff was creating a brand and he fought hard to have this look be the beginning of that, that brand creation. And it's, it's done really, really well. But I think what, um, you know, what, what you'll see in that is that it delivers on a lot of those elements we talked about. It delivers on the authenticity. It delivers, the, the person that's gonna buy this product that's gonna pay a little extra money for this non-GMO product is it, it, it then is you know somebody who believes in natural foods and whole all that kind of stuff and this fits on so many dimensions for that and what i, I want to say is when this was first presented to retail buyers who are uh, people who are you know working for giant or kroger or whoever and are deciding what products go on the shelf the first couple of meetings i was in with them when the package was shown these guys who are seasoned guys that don't sit and don't have a lot of nice things to say. They're very tough audiences. Uh, the first few of them absolutely said, that's the nicest package I've seen in a long time. 
and it's going to really stand out on the shelf because the butter category was a sleepy little category up until then. So, um, yeah, it, it definitely made a, a huge difference. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and it, again, it goes back. If you, if you, um, if you trust your, your design team, if you trust the people who are trying to lead you to a certain place, um, you'll be okay with it. it. It should work out for you. You get qualified people when you're moving forward. Um, there's a lot of finesse that was on the front of that package. And here you go right now. This is this is something where this is a, a promotional piece that we put together for sales. Um, and it was a simple, beautiful barn with that old logo, supposedly, you know, etched into the barn the way we see it a million times and, and barns and stuff like that. Um, and with the grassland, I mean, that's the whole brand. That's the story. That's not what that other package was. That had nothing to do with what we're looking at right now. Right. Uh, but they're, they were the butter, butter people since 1904. So, uh, yeah, we were real proud of this and it's, it's nice. It's, it's real fun. And the butter is fantastic. Um, here's one that goes back to what Mark spoke to earlier about icons. And we were working on a project with Paula Dean before she had her fall of grace and all her troubles, uh, about eight years ago. And we decided to put her on the cover or on the package of all the packages, yeah, interacting with her food or stirring a pan or, or, or whatever. Uh, this is some samples of some chocolate bars or chocolate treats she had, um, where she's the personality, uh, bright, and shiny, and, and, and fun. You can go to the next one, Mark. Yep. And some of the other elements that went along with that package were, and there, you can see another butter package up there, um, were these little call-outs. The call-out to the right that says yummy, crunchy flavor. This was almost as if she was speaking to you. We have a violet, we had a violator on every package to talk about. Uh, something specific to that particular product. Uh, fresh from the garden taste or yummy, crunchy flavor with Paula's signature, which was kind of neat. And uh, all these little cool little uh, violators. Instead of it being a burst that said new and approved, it said yummy, crunchy flavor. Uh, and, the, and she had a premium line of stuff too. This barbecue sauce label where you just see the label. That was an illustration that I did of her that she approved and, and we moved forward on. That was, that was really fun. It's such a shame she had all her troubles, but that's the, that's the problem you have when you have someone who, uh, uh, a spokesperson, something can go really wrong real fast. Not everybody gets a Steve Jobs, right? Fresh Gourmet is, is a um, company that specializes in salad toppings, salad stuff, anything that would be in the produce section. Now, it started out as salad uh, croutons. But now they're in the produce section doing just about everything. Um, the, if you go to the next one, Mark, uh, the package on the far left is a flat. It's not filled with any product. But that was their package that I saw in 1996 or 7. And that was the actual package. And it, it did have some distribution. But their big shtick was we want to get into the produce section. We want people to think that this is a gourmet premium. Uh, crouton and we're going to sell it along with lettuce tomato and it actually might help in site sales and that was their sales guys that was the sales force that went out and spoke to um all the shop all the uh, retailers to, to, to all the food stores they said you you stop these in your place and we're going to sell more peppers tomatoes all kinds of stuff so the package you see on the right is just a little bit of a switch we, we modified the logo a little bit. We simplified the type so you could read it. It wasn't, we simplified the salad. Um, so that was kind of cool and that was real nice. So that was more of a, a transitional package. And then if we go to the next one, we start getting a little more, have a lot more fun, uh, getting a lot more colorful. We have the Fresh Gourmet logo with a, a completely modified salad. And you can kind of see on the right-hand side of that photograph on the left, there's tortilla strips. So they end up doing tortilla strips. Uh, They're into nuts now and cranberries and all that stuff. Um, so it, it was a really exciting time. And that brand that kept growing and growing and growing. Uh, because first of all, they had a great sales team, the sales force. And the product was fantastic. Uh, um, but we were real happy with the branding on that as well. The little um, booklet off to the side is... Um, their brochure, you know, to the to the uh, grocer, and their stick was, you know, we're your partners in produce. 
you stock our stuff and we're going to sell more, more, more of your products. So today, as they move forward, um, they have, uh, they're changing, go ahead, Mark. They're changing into um, this where they've abandoned the flag so much. They still have, they had the flag on some products, but they have just the typography of fresh gourmet. They're trying to simplify and get a little more modern, but their packaging is a lot more hip and a lot more graphic. Um, there's date packaging on the left uh, and uh, hummus packaging on the right where they're using clear labels and, and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, they keep ahead of the curve as far as uh, tone and, and what they're trying to do. Considering where they came from that many years ago, it, it's, it's still an exciting brand. It's, there's still a lot of fun. If you back the other way, Oh, wait, I lost you. Here I am rambling yep. on talking to myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're sorry about exposed. that. I, I muted myself. So what I was trying to say is I wanted to go back real quickly. This is good uh, product, you know, a, a good example of, of where you change over time, right? And how you need to evolve. So this is a nice packaging. It's talking about the brand up here and it's in its little iconic bit. And it's, here's a quick description of its oven baked bread. That's a nice product attribute. Now we talk about more the grams of trans fat that it has because that was an important element at that point. This exactly. is a very pretty package, uh, very premium looking, supporting that that proper that that value proposition the way they were. And then you move into this, and today's consumers they want to know about their label readers now, right? So here's all the positives and negatives that are associated with, or lack of negatives that are associated with the brand today. You still have the fresh gourmet, the, the, the branding is still there, but now you're expanding into all the other elements and changing for what consumers today want to know more about your product, as we were talking about earlier, and, and that whole sustainability piece and the values that you represent. This clearly states what kind of company you are, but stays mm -hmm. true to the brand um, in, in its long history. So it's, it's a beautiful example of, of that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, Jay Skinner, okay. okay. Jay Skinner, uh, real fast, was a company very, very similar to Edmonds out of Omaha, Nebraska. They had absolutely no brand whatsoever. They would sell uh, clamshells with uh, Danish inside of them. They st still currently do, but at the, at that time, the uh, you just saw this. You'd walk into the the, the uh, dessert party or bakery or the bakery section, and just see all these clamshells with Danish on top. Mark, if you go to the next one. Um, imagine this without that uh, sleeve on it. It's just as really a, a very pretty Danish, but you don't look, you don't get anything from it. You don't get the look inside. Um, and what we tried to do with this particular label was cut the Danish, show all the layers of Danish dough, show some of the apples, color code it, and give it some life on shelf rather than just the sea of plastic. Plastic. It was just nothing going on on shelf. Um, we did this and we were very successful with this for quite a few years. But as Mark was talking earlier with sustainability, it's bad enough that we have to package these things in, in plastic the way we do. There's still no way around that. There's no technology that we have that we can deliver a Danish any other way. So the next slide you'll see is the latest update to the package. It's still the clamshell, it's still the sea of clamshells, but what we did was put a clear label on it. A very elegant, pretty label that shows uh, the apples or the pecans or the lemons or whatever it is. Um, but it saves all that bulk, it saves all that label and all that um, trees 
and uh, it's just a very small, clear label at the point right at this point right now. And that's because that's what consumers want, and that's how everything changed. Uh, same thing. This is a new product of theirs. It's a uh, energy bar. So we're just using the plastic um, uh, sleeve again, unfortunately, but creating a more a little more hipper, a little more fun uh, energy bar that's actually good for you. It doesn't have a lot of uh, preservatives and crap in it, and they're delicious too. And again, you know, I, I love the playfulness of you're, you're listing the the ingredients, the important ingredients that are paying off the brand of being all natural and all that, but then you're adding in the other yummy goodness. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful playfulness uh, associated with the brand. And then unlock your potential is, a, is, is a, another element of that personality that we talked about early on, right? This is all about sort of establishing a brand personality for this sub product line for them. And um, it's a really good example that way. Yeah, I think the next one, if the next one is the last one. Oh, no, this one's just, this is more just pretty picture. Um, I do, The next one is going to be more about the components of a brand and that storytelling aspect. But this one is just, I can't imagine going into a store or a 7-Eleven or a Wawa, or I'm not sure where everybody's from here, but, and trying to pick up that bottle on the left, it was just, uh, it's just amazing what some people do. And here's the message. Well, this is a messaging story. Look at what, look at how many things they were trying to say on that little tiny label and you couldn't read one of them, not one of them. Um, what we did was go to a clear label once again, um, make a more very, make an elegant still life of just the fruit or the flavor that with it was with that water, keep all the type and all the branding simple, keep even the um, messaging at the top, very, very simple and clean. We tried to make this water more like fashion more like um, Halston, the Halston of water, if there was such a thing. But it is, it really is. It, it, was, it, it was a nice line. It was a real nice uh, fine line. And, and uh, this did really well for them until they went out of business because of mismanagement or what have you. But it really had a lot of strength for a long, long time. And I was really proud of this. But you know, when you start with something like that on the left and th then they come to you, there's really no place else to go but up. So <laughs> this, this was a redesign. It just works out really, really well. Very proud of this guy. Well, and and to, to, again, to echo, like um, this is, I, I'm assuming when on the left side, it was a premium price water. You're talking about it back in its day, antioxidants. It, you know, it's got all these other elements in terms of replenishment stuff and all that. And, and it is a lot that they're trying to get across on the label. But there's no way that that package delivered against a premium or super premium image and, and all of the wonderful things it delivered. That right side, it doesn't even look like the same company. I mean, it's just, it, it delivers on all of those levers and um, it, it looks all natural. It's very eye appealing. I want to grab it off the shelf just looking at it. And, the, and it's delivering against that whole personality of antioxidants, all the elements that are that the brand has stood for. So the funny again, part about that, and, and what I, I hope you guys kind of take with you, uh, what the group would, would have would be, we said to them, and actually in focus groups, what is it going to look like when you're walking down the street holding that bottle on the right compared to that bottle? It's not so much, I didn't want to say fashion is a bad word, but I wanted to make a statement about you. I wanted, it's like, it's like the Nike logo. If you're going to walk around and walk out of a 7-Eleven or walk out of a food store with one of these bottles of water, that's going to say something specifically about you. That was what we were trying to do. So, and it and marks dead on. It was a, you know, for, for back in the day, it was a pretty cool water with all the vitamins in it. And, and it, it didn't taste too false or anything. It was pretty cool. And the last one is all about messaging. And this is one from, uh, this is a story from Jump. Uh, the better chip. Uh, I am going to have to read this part partially, partially because I have to always uh, ref refresh myself. But better, the better chip is made with whole grain corn, flour, fresh diced vegetables. So what they do, the chips you see on the right are corn chips, but with huge chunks of jalapeno in them, or they would have red pepper, or they would have beets, or whatever the heck would be in it. But it's not just blown on crappy flavor that gets on your fingers. This is honest to God, really great baked chips. So rather than hydrated ingredients or seasonings, Better Chip always uses fresh stuff. They're non-GMO. Um, 
and they, we wanted to do with what, uh, what we did with fresh gourmet, putting the croutons in the um, produce section, not in the middle of the aisles with potato chips and all that crap. We wanted to be sold in the deli section where all the dips and the meats and the cheeses are. So um, well, that was our strategy with this. And we really thought we had a, we really did have a better chip, which was great. And um, uh, our approach was how do we hit deli and how do we move forward? So I'm gonna wait for Mark to move to the next slide. I'm coming back. Oh, there he is. And, and I'm gonna show you some of the, some of the initial designs and then we'll show you where we ended up. In the beginning, we talked about possibly making it uh, have a feel of uh, a kind of a Mayan or Mexican or something, but feel like that. We, we had a name called Isabella's. Um, uh, jalapeno, the flavor is always really key, but there's an awful lot of messaging here. There's a, there's a problem with too much to read. And one of the key things we did wrong when this initial design stage was we wanted to show the dips. We wanted to show the place it wanted to be, but we were covering up the chip. Well, that was stupid. Uh, we don't want to cover up the point that it's all full of all these great things, but um, it had a nice kind of feel to it. And we thought there was at least a beginning of something with that one big, large chip. If you go to the next one, uh, we started to focus on a still life. Just visually, we started to focus on a still life of several chips no dips, no nothing, and maybe some of the elements behind there that that had the that they were made of. Um, we still kind of kept some color coding, which we thought was important because I think we started with maybe four flavors or five flavors, but then we started looking at um, names, and we got over to the better chip because we really felt it was a better chip. Uh, the only bad part is the better chip would include. So we started looking around at how to say the better chip. So the next part you'll see is kind of the same packaging, but with different logo treatments or different typography. Like what does that say with the chip? And then the eye supposedly has the inclusions in it. That's what's popping out of the uh, the eye part of the, uh, in the word chip. Still the same, still life playing with the word jalapeno. If we go to the next one, it's another one. Better chip, show the chip with the inclusions. Eventually we got a word rid of the word inclusions because it sounds horrible and we just stuck with the better chip and the next slide is the logo the final logo we came up with which was um uh, a kind of nice little swash kind of uh, hand lettered deal uh, but with the asterisks over top of the eye and you'll see next the reason for that is we always had a, a little uh, Underneath all the better chip logos is uh, another asterisk that says naturally gluten free or what it's made with fresh red bell pepper. So it all kind of came in together. So the logo at the top, um, uh, the logo at the top and, and the promise of what was going on with that chip were married together. And then you, you just go right to the food and then you go below that to uh, the flavor profile. But I think you can kind of get the flavor profile it, 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 I love that the fact there's two separate pieces, the branding at top and all that great information about the food next to each other. And that was in a typical bag. So when we evolved that about a year and a half later, we had a more aggressive color coding system, better chip. And then we, had, we came up with the tagline, the flavors inside, not on top. So the flavors inside became the um, sign off to this with the low asterisks. Uh, but the color coding got a lot more aggressive, which was really fun. And now we introduced this um, magnifying glass, if you, if you can see that, uh, where the flavors inside, it helps support that. So you look and you hold a magnifying glass up and you see the beets or you see the chipotles. Um, and then the next iteration of this was instead of having a bag, we wanted to do a flat bag. We wanted to do something that would stand up by itself, a gusseted pouch. It, it, it was easier to merchandise. It looks much better on shelf. Um, and this was the mechanical, the flat mechanical, before it gets folded, of what this looked like. So we color coded all the tops uh, and the bottom of the bag, we kept in a very dark gray so it could sit and gave it a nice base, a nice resting spot to the eye. And Mark, if you hit the next one, that should show it all folded. And that's how it looks like when it's on shelf. 
it's folded, it's gusseted, it sits straight up. It's not a, it's not like a bag of, you know, wise potato chips that falls all over the place. Um, and it's, it's very, it tells you exactly what's going on. Uh, spinach and kale, whole grain chips. All of our, we kept all of our nut nutritional information at the bottom in one spot. And uh, if you go to the next one, you'll see how that played out, which was really cool. A lot of personality and a lot of fun. Uh, and again, this, this particular design was created so we would have that great impact because there is so much competition out there. All, again, I can't emphasize enough. Look at who your competitors are. Try and understand who your competitors are and how are you going to be different? What is your offering? What are you going to make different uh, to, to sell your brand? Um, and that's, that's what we constantly had to do to uh, the deli managers, the deli section. The next graphic is us. This is a, this is a sales piece that we went to, to the salespeople, uh, to the deli section in, in the grocery stores. We talked about uh, old time chips and how they stunk and how about uh, like bagel chips. Nobody wants that anymore. Nobody wants pretzels anymore, but we have this really great chip over here. Take a look at our brand and take a look at this. Um, next one. Oops. All right. And this one here is um, this, we told the, the retailer, take a look at our branding and take a look how we stand out on shelf. You have all the Stacy's and you have all the pretzel crisps and all the other junk, but look how, look at this offering. We really think we have something going on. Plus our product is better than theirs. So the before and after truly is, this is what we were, this was the promise to the, to the uh, retailer. And then lo and behold, these actual photographs from different stores, they went, they bought into it. Um, we thought that our packaging carved out a, these aren't great photos or anything, but you can kind of see they stocked us right there at eye level, right where everybody's shopping, which was pretty awesome. Um, and our colors are kind of fun and, and neat. And again, this is one of those things where perception, um, you know, it looks a lot better than some of those other guys. Um, and if you notice on the left too, we were the first ones to say better, the better chip, better chip. And then somebody kind of copied us. On the left-hand photo, they went to the way better chip. They're not. They're not the way better chip. So I just want to point that out. <laughs> um, the last, the last one is actually, I guess, the one we should have started with. This was a social media image that I created, uh, and this is the whole story. I mean, what the copy line says all. This is pretty much how it works. You know, you crack that thing, and as soon as you bite into that chip, I mean, it's it's nice. If you want a nice spicy chip that doesn't have a bunch of crap on it. And it's wholesome and made really well. This is the chip for you, and that's how it works. So, that's some of the opportunities you have with branding and, and, and creating a brand. So, I, I think uh, you know we've hit it a, a number of times through tonight. That um, you know it, it, the 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 key elements are you know obviously it's got to be creative, compelling, clear, and consistent. That's your messaging, your brand identity, all of that needs to be uh, captured um, within that and, and all of those elements. And I think a number of the examples we showed certainly pay that off. Um, and I, uh, I know uh, we're basically at our eight o'clock close, so I don't want to hold people up. Um, I believe Divya has posted a reminder that tomorrow night um, from 6.30 to 8.30, Jeff and I will be available for some one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and, and take you through that as, as part of our office hour program. Happy to talk to you if, uh, if that fits into your- I'm very sorry I went on too long, guys. No, you did great, you did great. Divya, back to you. Thank you so much, Mark and Jeff. Um, a lot of attendees have found this helpful. I have posted a link, uh, a survey link. Please fill that. It is required by our funders, the Small Business Administration, so that we can provide no cost webinars to you. Um, I have also posted a link to the office hours, as Mark said, um, and a link to our resources page. You can um, go and check our um, resources document where you'll see all the upcoming webinars. Uh, um, thank you, you so much. Wait, 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 Debbie, before you sign off, Veronica, just answer your question real quick. Uh, you ask, what do you ask yourself to get your brand clear and it's easier to move what's not, what does not work? It basically, you have to ask yourself and consumers a lot of questions to really get inside their head. It's not what you think is important, it's what a consumer thinks is important. So talk to your friends, your family, your uh, whoever, and ask them 
um, make sure that you're communicating on a clear level. And we can talk more. If you want to talk more about that tomorrow night, we'd love to. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. You all, it was a pleasure. Take care. Good night.